International help is pledged for India as it battles a ferocious second wave of COVID. Its cities are struggling to cope, both with managing those lost to the virus and with keeping patients alive, with oxygen in short supply. Government is a literal failure. A person cannot live here in Delhi. A person cannot even die peacefully in Delhi. With the epidemic still growing, the UK and other countries are sending medical supplies to India. Also tonight, the Downing Street refurbishment. It is still not clear how work on Boris Johnson's flat was initially paid for. Testing the COVID waters, the Carabao Cup final allows 8,000 spectators into Wembley. And from the usual red carpet to this, how a train station is hosting tonight's Oscars. Good evening. International help is being pledged for India as it battles a ferocious second wave of coronavirus described by Prime Minister Narendra Modi as a storm that has shaken the nation. Almost 350,000 new infections were recorded in, in India in the latest 24-hour period and 2,767 people have died. But experts say the actual numbers are likely to be much higher. As the epidemic continues to grow, hospitals are under intense pressure with shortages of beds and critical supplies, including oxygen. In the capital, Delhi, COVID is now killing one person every four minutes. Our correspondent Yogi Talimai reports from there. The capital is being ravaged at a frightening speed. With every pyre that burns, India's self-belief is dying. Each funeral is a story of personal loss and national shame. Charanjeev Malhotra has been helping to cremate the dead for decades. Now, he barely ever stops working. I've never seen such a terrifying situation. I can't believe that we're in the capital of India. People aren't getting oxygen and they're dying like animals, he says. We don't even have enough resources to cremate them properly. Outside, Shivangi Mehra is on the phone organizing oxygen for the hospital she works in. Nothing, nothing is being done. I don't know government is sleeping or what they are doing. I am totally disheartened in the situation which I am seeing. Government is a literal failure. A person cannot live here in Delhi. A person cannot even die peacefully in Delhi. She's waiting to cremate her grandfather, who died, she says, because there wasn't enough oxygen. This small hospital in North Delhi is facing a daily struggle. Ma'am, we have been spending sleepless nights since uh, last one week. I mean, we, at times we feel like crying because we are not able to help pa patients properly. Every day, this is a, it's the same scenario. We are left only with two hours of oxygen, three hours of death. Uh, I mean, and uh, we are only getting assurance from the system, no oxygen. And so, families are being told to organize oxygen. At one medical shop, we found people with empty cylinders waiting to buy their own supply for loved ones who urgently need it. For many here, the government's promises of rushing in oxygen are coming too late. Families left asking why something so basic is unavailable. Every crematorium we've been to, we've seen body after body being brought in. It's hard for anyone to keep count, but what workers have been telling me is that the real scale of deaths caused by COVID-19 in India is a lot higher than what official numbers reflect. And a lot of those who've died right now have done so because they couldn't get oxygen in time. Jitender Singh Shanti runs a group of volunteers here. Even young people are dying. It's a very bad situation. If it keeps getting worse, we'll have to burn bodies by the side of the road, he says. There is a sense of abandonment in this country. Citizens are stepping up to do what a government should, left to fight a vicious pandemic on their own. Yogita Lemay, BBC News, Delhi. 
Well, tonight, a first shipment of British assistance to India is leaving the UK. Other countries are also pledging support. Our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams, is here in the studio. What kinds of help uh, is being sent, Paul? Well, Michelle, this was really the weekend when the world stood up and took notice of what's going on in India, not least because a wildfire of infections like that in a country as large as India, 1.4 billion people, is clearly not just a local danger, it's a global danger. And given those numbers, any, any reaction seems like a bit of a drop in the bucket. But those offers are coming in. The United, United Kingdom is sending 495 oxygen concentrators, 140 ventilators, and the Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab says there could be more. The EU has activated what it calls its civil protection mechanism, where member countries pool their emergency supplies, again with an emphasis on oxygen and medicines. And the US, perhaps stung into action uh, by moves on this side of the Atlantic, has said that it will immediately supply the raw materials for vaccines, and that'll involve reversing some export controls put in place back in February, uh, and supply protective gear and medical equipment. And Dr. Anthony Fauci, the president's chief medical advisor, has even suggested that the United States could supply India with some of its unused uh, AstraZeneca vaccines. That's a vaccine that has been approved, has not yet been approved for use in the United States, and it's got lots of it, and it doesn't need it itself. It's already supplied some of it to Mexico and Canada earlier in the year, so it is coming under some pressure to do that for India as well. Paul Adams, thank you very much. In Iraq, a fire at a hospital treating coronavirus patients in Baghdad has killed 82 people. More than 100 others were injured in the blaze, which was reportedly caused by an exploding oxygen cylinder. Iraq's health minister has been suspended as an inquiry is launched amid widespread public anger. Here, the latest figures on coronavirus show there were 1,712 new infections in the latest 24-hour period which means an average of 2,438 new cases per day in the last week. 11 deaths were recorded in the last 24 hours of people who'd had a positive COVID test in the previous 28 days. There were on average 23 deaths per day in the last week. The total number of UK deaths is now 127,428. On vaccinations, just over 140,000 people had a first jab in the last 24 hours, taking that total to more than 33.5 million. Just under half a million had a second jab, which means more than 12.5 million people have now had both doses of a COVID vaccine. The International Trade Secretary, Liz Truss, has denied claims that Boris Johnson broke the rules over refurbishing his Downing Street flat. On Friday, the former Number 10 adviser, Dominic Cummings, accused the Prime Minister of planning to ask Conservative donors to pay for the work in secret, something Mr Cummings described as foolish and possibly illegal. This report from our political correspondent, Ian Watson, contains some flashing images. December 2019, electoral success for Boris Johnson and there was work to be done on the flat he shared in Downing Street with fiancé Carrie Simons. And it's how this refurb was paid for that's now in the spotlight. When the Prime Minister's closest adviser left Downing Street late last year, some in government worried about what secrets might emerge from that box. Dominic Cummings now claims that Boris Johnson planned to ask Conservative donors to foot the bill for the flat. He described this as unethical, foolish and possibly illegal. This government minister was asked if Boris Johnson got any financial help from a party donor. Here's a spoiler alert. You won't hear the words yes or no. My understanding is the costs are being covered by the Prime Minister and everything is being fully declared in line with the rules. Did a Tory party donor lend him the money beforehand? As I said, he is covering the costs and it's being complied so I, with fully and The, the question is, did a donor provide the money beforehand? Andrew, I am spending my time in intense trade negotiations, mm. well, getting a good deal for the United Kingdom. I'm not spending my time thinking about the Downing Street flat refurbishment. Downing Street insists that no electoral laws were broken, no codes of conduct breached when the flat here was given a makeover. But some questions remain. How much did it cost? When exactly did the Prime Minister pay for it out of his own pocket? And did his party or any of its donors put cash into his pocket in the first place? Did you get it wrong, Mr Cummings? And Labour tried to outdo Dominic Cummings' attack on Boris Johnson, questioning any links between ministers and businesses too. Did you get it wrong, Prime Minister? 
the government have to answer to why they've given out billions of pounds of money to their cronies and their friends and they won't even declare it through the current rules. Publish the members' interests and ministers' interests and publish who's on that VIP list and tell us about where you're getting this money from, Boris, to do up your flat. Dominic Cummings was seen by some as a master of the political message. He now seems intent on taking back control of the agenda from his old boss and he'll have more to say about his time in Downing Street soon. Well, here at Westminster tomorrow, Michelle, the country's most senior civil servant, Simon Case, will be questioned by a committee of MPs. And I'm told he's going to be asked about another of Dominic Cummings' allegations, that the Prime Minister tried to halt a leak inquiry in case it put a friend of his fiance, Carrie Simons, in the frame. Now, Downing Street say that's absolutely false. But there's more to come. Next month, Dominic Cummings himself is going to be questioned by another committee of MPs, and we could see some previously unpublished documents on how the government has handled the pandemic. So it would seem that Dominic Cummings' departure from Downing Street, rather like COVID, has something of a long tail. Ian Watson in Westminster, thank you. Let's take a look now at some of today's other news. A 14-year-old boy has been charged with the murder of another teenager in East London. Faris Matu, who was also 14, was stabbed outside a pizza restaurant in Newham on Friday. His death is the 33rd homicide in London since the start of the year. An Indonesian Navy submarine that sank off the coast of Bali on Wednesday has been found split into three pieces on the seabed. All 53 crew has been, have been confirmed dead. The military hasn't said whether the vessel was overloaded when it went missing during a torpedo firing drill. Firefighters say they've managed to get a huge gorse fire on the Mourne Mountains in Northern Ireland under control after it burned for three days. It affected an area equivalent to 500 football pitches. The cause is still under investigation. Apple is shortly expected to release an update to its operating system, this time including a change that has sparked a row with another tech giant, Facebook. It's all about whether users are asked for permission before their activity is tracked and what that means for digital advertising. Here's our media editor, Amol Rajan. Two of the most powerful men in history are engaged in a very modern conflict. Tim Cook of Apple and Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook are in an ideological and commercial argument about how open the internet should be. And it's coming to a head with Apple releasing the latest update to the operating system on its iPhones, what's known as iOS 14.5. Until now, if you own an Apple phone, all the apps you've downloaded have automatic access to something called your unique identifier for advertisers. This is a building block of digital advertising. It allows companies, if they want, to track your activity across other apps and so build a detailed picture of your behaviour, your location, interests, spending habits and much else besides. With iOS 14.5, Apple is going to flick an enormous digital switch and only allow companies to track your activity on their own apps, unless you give explicit permission. In other words, presumed consent will be no more. Facebook has launched an extraordinary PR campaign against Apple, taking full-page adverts out in US newspapers, saying these moves will limit small businesses wanting to run personalised ads and reach customers effectively. They argue that Apple, currently worth over $2 trillion, that's nearly three times Facebook's value, are motivated by money because they take up to 30% commissions from sales through the App Store. Apple argue this is about the principle of privacy. Though Tim Cook said a few weeks ago that he wasn't focused on Facebook, back in January he also said if a business is built on misleading users on data exploitation, on choices that are no choices at all, it does not deserve our praise, it deserves reform. Ouch. The open, advertiser fueled web does have huge advantages for small businesses and many users, but it involves trade-offs. Our data trails mean we are targeted and often manipulated in ways we don't fully appreciate. Apple control the hardware and so have the power here. That's one reason Facebook are investing so heavily in the hardware of the future. Augmented reality smart glasses combining encyclopedic knowledge with what's in front of our eyes. Apple are believed to be working on a rival project. The deeper question here is how much does privacy matter to you in this digital age? And while we ponder that, the battle between Cook and Zook is shaping our future. Amol Rajan reporting there. Now the sport. Let's join Sarah Mulkerens at the BBC Sports Centre. Hello, Sarah. 
Thank you very much, Michelle. Good evening. Pep Guardiola said winning felt much better with fans as Manchester City beat Tottenham to win their fourth League Cup title in a row. Wembley hosted 8,000 supporters as part of the pilot programme in England aimed at getting spectators back to sport. Natalie Perks was there. It was described as the ultimate betrayal. But the closed shop secret Super League plans unravelled spectacularly when the old adage proved true. Football without fans is nothing. Cheers, cheers. Come on, it's good to be back. It was fitting today then that they returned. 2,000 Manchester City fans came to London by train and coach their first away day in more than a year. Have your tests ready, please, guys. A negative test was a condition of entry for this government pilot, but for the 8,000 allowed in, it was more than worth it. The, the buzz, the excitement being here is amazing. We want to make a noise, we want to be, but it's not going to be like a full stadium, but we're going to, we're going to do our best. So The sun's shining, we're in the final, onwards and upwards. Well, today is an important step on the road to recovery for football, but also an important day for these two teams. Amidst all the chaos last week, Tottenham sacked Jose Mourinho and brought in their former player, Ryan Mason, after a nightmare season for Spurs fans. Could today be a fairy tale? 29 is a tender age to lead troops to the front line, but from the off, his side were under siege. Until half-time, it was one-way traffic. But where City were wasteful, Hugo Lloris was keeping Spurs in it. For all City's passing and possession, though, it was a set piece that ended Tottenham's dream. Oh, and it's put away. Some thought Emmerich Laporte was lucky to still be on the pitch after some cynical tackling. But where Spurs were static, Laporte was statuesque. Spurs' 13-year wait for a trophy goes on. But in the week, City's owners made a huge misstep on the pitch fans had a beautiful reminder of just how super football can be. Natalie Perks, BBC News, Wembley. Match of the day follows the news and in Scotland it is sports scene, so if you don't want to know the other football results, then look away now. Burnley had their biggest away win in Premier League history with a 4-0 thrashing of Wolves, which moves them towards retaining top flight football next season. Today's two other games finished as draws. St Johnston stunned Rangers in the Scottish Cup quarterfinals, coming from a goal behind in extra time to win on penalties. They're joined in the last four by Dundee United, who had a comfortable 3 0 win at Aberdeen. Chelsea got an all important away goal, but trailed Bayern Munich after the first leg of their Women's Champions League semi final. The Blues are looking to reach the final of the competition for the first time. It ended 2-1 in Germany with the return leg next Sunday. British teenager Jessica Gadarova capped off a remarkable European Gymnastics Championships in Switzerland by winning gold in the floor event. The 16-year-old was making her senior debut in the competition and had already won silver and bronze medals earlier in the week. There is more on the BBC Sport website, including today's results from the Cricket County Championship. Back to you, Michelle. Sarah, thank you very much. This year's Academy Awards will begin in Los Angeles in a few hours' time. A very different occasion to the usual, with the ceremony being held this time in a train station. A number of British stars are up for Oscars, including Anthony Hopkins, Kerry Mulligan, Riz Ahmed and Olivia Colman. Let's join our correspondent, Sophie Long, now. Sophie. Well, Michelle, after a rather strange and drawn-out awards season, the grand finale is now in sight. Hollywood's biggest night of the year would normally be dominated by red carpets, parties and champagne. This year, though, there's been more of a focus on COVID testing, vaccines and quarantine. And the ceremony itself is leaving its Hollywood home of more than 20 years and going downtown. The iconic Art Deco Union Station has undergone an eight-year facelift ahead of its starring role in a ceremony which producers are promising will look and feel like a movie. That's the real magic of the movies. Mank leads the field with ten nominations, a traditional contender in an untraditional year. Nine of the 20 nominated in the main acting categories are people of colour. I know what I'm doing. Including Chadwick Boseman and Viola Davis for their roles in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. 
Chloe Zhao could win Best Director for Nomadland, which would make her only the second woman to do so in the award's 93-year history. But she faces stiff competition from Emerald Fennell, the promising young woman, which could also deliver Best Actress for Kerry Mulligan. So this is where the magic will happen. The vast majority of the ceremony will take place right here in person. There'll be no Zoom calls and there's a dress code. There's been a very clear no thanks to sweatpants. Bula. It will be smaller. Only nominees and their plus ones have been invited. The producer of Ardman's Shaun the Sheep, Farmageddon, will be among them. Excited, nervous, kind of unsure what to expect but you know to, to have the opportunity to go is is fantastic composer and director chris bowers has been nominated for a concerto is a conversation a short documentary about his family do you know what it's gonna be like because everybody has to get tested and also most people are vaccinated I, once you're on the premises i think it's like masks off and, and it'll definitely feel as like normal as they can make it which i think will be Pretty wild, definitely the biggest event I've been to since since COVID started. So finally, the Oscars buzz is building. Oh, the finale is going to be sensational, and we're building to it now. You feel it uh, you, when you when you see the transformation of what's happening in inside the, the station, and the wild anticipation you feel. Your heart quickens because it's so good. <laughs> Sophie Long, BBC News, not in Hollywood, but downtown LA. Well, a first look at tomorrow morning's newspapers is coming up in a moment on the BBC News Channel on BBC One. Time now for the news wherever you are. Good night.